Hi Chem 101 students and welcome back to the last lecture in the solutions chapter. This one's going to be about heterogeneous mixtures and collative properties. Uh, so we'll start to talk about what are the differences between solutions which are homogeneous mixtures and other types of heterogeneous mixtures. We'll talk about the effects of having uh, solutes dissolved in solvents which includes for freezing point depression and boiling point elevation, and also osmosis. These together are referred to as colligative properties. Uh, they're properties that depend on the amount of dissolved solute. So um, first of all, uh, when it comes to solutions, we said that the, the particles that are in the solution are individual atoms, molecules, or ions. So that's what we learned in the previous part about solutions. Uh, but what about other mixtures? Uh, in, in other mixtures, such as colloids, uh, there are small chunks or pieces of things. Uh, they're about a thousand times larger than a molecule, uh, more or less, uh, which is a size of about 10 to the minus 7 centimeters to about 10 to the minus 5 centimeters. Um, the way you'll recognize a colloid usually is, uh, what, number one is they're not going to settle into layers in, uh, upon sitting, but they will appear cloudy. And so you can think of like milk here. Milk is a colloid. Uh, it appears cloudy, but unlike some other mixtures that may uh, separate out, as long as you've got homogenized milk, like the kind you'd buy at the store, it's not going to settle into layers. Uh, if it did just straight come out of the cow, it would actually make a separate layer on the top of fats and watery, more watery milk on the bottom. But your homogenized milk, uh, which isn't actually completely homo uh, homogeneous. It's more more homogeneous than what comes out of the cow, which is a suspension, actually. We'll talk about that next. Uh, but uh, uh, the milk that you buy and probably drink from the store is a colloid because it will not settle into layers, but it does have a cloudy appearance to it, uh, unlike solutions, which appear relatively transparent. Uh, if you are trying to separate the components of a colloid with uh, with the solute or the, sol uh, the solvent rather um, the particles they will pass through a filter paper but they won't pass through a membrane so you may have heard of a process called reverse osmosis which is for purifying water that involves a synthetic membrane a membrane is just a, uh, a either biological or a synthetic uh, material which has very small holes in it through which water and other small water soluble particles can pass but uh, larger particles cannot and so that reverse osmosis passing the water through a membrane helps to filter the water out basically on a very uh, m microscopic level uh, so <clears throat> you can separate the components of a colloid using a membrane, but you can't do it using a filter paper. The particles will pass through the filter paper. Uh, if you want another way to demonstrate that a mixture is a colloid rather than a, a uh, solution is if you look at the way that light travels through the colloid. So if, if you uh, shine a beam of light through the colloid, you'll see that the pathway of the light is visible because the light is being scattered. And that is the same phenomenon that leads to the, uh, to the cloudy appearance of colloids. So some examples that you may recognize, milk, mayonnaise, other cloudy type of foods, uh, creams and lotions, hand creams, lotions, these are colloids. Uh, clouds are colloids, there are small droplets of water in the air, not individual molecules of water because that would be clear, we'd be able to see through it, it would be transparent, but it's cloudy because there are small drops of water spread out through the air. And so you can recognize a colloid by the Tyndall effect. So on the right here is a, uh, is a glass of water with a small amount of protein powder, which has been put in it. And, and the, the other one is, is just some uh, salt water. And so you can see the salt water is a solution. The individual sodium and chloride ions do not scatter the light. So you can't see the beam of light within the, the liquid. It passes through. You got a little reflection there. But it's because it's transparent. It's not cloudy. But when you shine a beam of light into the colloid, you can see the beam because the light is being scattered. Uh, and so a protein solution, for example, that appears cloudy, your protein powder solution, uh, because proteins are large molecules. They're too large uh, to, to make a solution, so they scatter the light and make a colloid. 
Um, so again, as I mentioned, the protein powder there in the last glass that you saw, large molecules such as starch and protein and cellulose, which is like fiber, which you have in Metamucil, it's a structural component of plants uh, that can't be digested. These large biomolecules will, will uh, form a colloid. They won't form a solution. They're just too large, uh, so they scatter the light. So you will want to remember that, you know, biomolecules such as starch and protein, these are large molecules. So I'll sometimes ask you, uh, you know, will, will these pass through a membrane? Uh, and the answer is no, uh, because the, the, the molecules are too, too large. They make a colloid. Um, emulsions are also colloids. So although we said, you know, if you want to mix something in water, it has to be polar. So nonpolar substances don't mix with water, such as oils. Uh, but you can mix them if you try, for example, uh, mol uh, mayonnaise is a mixture of oil and, and vinegar, which is acidic water, essentially. Uh, so you can mix them if you have an emulsifier molecule. So if, if you're thinking of, of mayonnaise here, mayonnaise isn't just made from oil and vinegar. It's got one other very important ingredient and that is the yolk of a, a raw egg. And so there's raw eggs in mayonnaise uh, because the yolk contains a emulsifier molecule called lecithin. And that emulsifier has a polar side and a nonpolar side. Uh, so if we were looking at a, a lecithin molecule, it would, it would kind of look like it's got a, a, a chain here like a, a kind of narrow chain. This is the nonpolar part. And then the, the end here, the head is the polar part. Uh, so they actually call this the polar head uh, in, in um, certain emulsifier molecules. And so the polar part would be attracted to the water uh, because it's polar. And the nonpolar part would be attracted to the oil. So in mayonnaise, you have little droplets of oil that have been surrounded by the nonpolar part of the emulsifier molecule. And, uh, and then that can then uh, mix with the water because on the outside, so in the oil, you'll have a bunch of these emulsifier molecules surrounding the little drops of oil. And then there will be water just all on the outside. So the water is attracted to the polar part and the oil is attracted to the nonpolar part. And, and that way you can mix a polar substance with a nonpolar substance. And so emulsions will be colloids as well because these droplets will be quite you know, large, even though they're not super large, not large enough to settle out, they are relatively large, large enough to scatter light. Uh, suspensions have larger particles in them then do colloids, uh, those particles, those little chunks of stuff are 10 to the minus five centimeters in diameter or larger. Uh, and so the way you'll differentiate a suspension from a colloid is the suspension will settle into layers uh, if you let it sit. So an example would be like a Italian salad dressing. If you, uh, if you, you know, you can shake that up, right? And put it on your salad, the oil and the water will mix temporarily, but if you leave it on the table for a few minutes, they'll start to separate and settle into layers because that oil and vinegar Italian dressing is a suspension, not a colloid. It will still have a cloudy appearance though, like a colloid, but the difference is that it will settle into layers. The other difference is how you would separate them. So in a suspension, uh, the particles will not pass through a filter paper. Uh, and so you can separate the components of a suspension using a filter paper, but you cannot separate the components of a colloid using a filter paper because the components of the colloid will pass through the filter paper. Both of them could be separated by a membrane though. Uh, the reason why these are a suspension and they separate over, uh, over time is because they're, they're mixtures of substances that, that do not want to mix. They're not attracted to each other. So oil and vinegar, for example, is uh, you know the oil is nonpolar and the water is polar, so they don't mix very well, and that's why they settle into layers over time. Uh, now, so that's a heterogeneous mixtures. We're going to go back to you know talking about uh, now 
uh, solutions a little bit uh, if you dissolve something uh, this kind of works for colloids too but if you have something dissolved in something else uh, a, a solute dissolved in a solvent uh, you get changes in the property of the solution the solution will be different than the uh, the sol solvent by itself without anything dissolved in it the result is uh, what are called freezing point depression and boiling point elevation so uh, if you add a non-volatile solute, non-volatile meaning it doesn't evaporate very easily, uh, to a liquid, it will extend the temperature range over which it remains a liquid. Uh, what this means is that the freezing point, the temperature at which it freezes, will be lower, and the boiling point, the temperature at which it boils, will be higher. Uh, so one note is that this only depends on how many solute particles are in solution, not the type of solute particles. Uh, and this really matters because if you dissolve, for example, sodium chloride in, in, uh, in water, it will make two particles. It will make a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Uh, and so w when you put in one mole of sodium chloride, you actually get two moles of, of particles out of that. Whereas for molecular substances, they don't do that. Uh, so the properties that depend on a number of dissolved solute particles, uh, these are called colligative properties. So freezing point depression and boiling point elevation are examples of that. So for freezing point depression, so a freezing point depression is a property that is used very regularly uh, in, in snowy areas. So think about if you, I don't know if any of you have lived in the mountains nearby or something, when, it, when it's, it's really cold outside and the, the road is starting to ice up, what do they do? Well, they throw some salt on it, right? And the idea is that uh, the salt begins to dissolve with the with the water that's on the surface there and it gets into the water that is forming the ice and ultimately when it begins to dissolve in that water on the surface that's forming the ice it makes a solution in which the freezing point is lower and thus that salty water that is now on the road will not freeze again and create icy roads and so that's why the roads are have salt put on them uh, so the, the freezing point of the solution that contains a non-volatile solute, such as a salt, is lower than the freezing point of the pure solvent, like the pure water. Um, one important point is that when freezing point depression and boiling point elevation are calculated, I'm not going to have you calculate the exact uh, um, values of these. I want you to understand the concept more. But a kind of concentration called molality is calculated which is actually depends on the kilograms of the solvent. And there are a few com complex reasons for that. So all the concentrations we talked about before, they were you know, per amount of solution. For molality, it depends on the amount of solvent uh, for rather complex reasons that I, I think it's, it, we won't go into because I'm not going to have you calculate molality. Uh, so notice that molality depends on the amount of solvent, whereas all the other concentrations uh, depend on the amount of solution. Your book is going to mention molality, and I mention it briefly, but I'm not going to have you do any calculations with molality and with uh, the, quant the amount of freezing point depression or boiling point elevation. So I do want you to still read that part, but I, I don't want you to do the, the problems in that section. I want you to simply understand the concept for these. Uh, <clears throat> there's enough to do in this chapter without that, actually. Uh, boiling point elevation, so if you put a, a solute in, in a solution, it causes the, the, the uh, boiling point of the solvent to be higher than it would be if the solvent were pure. Uh, so a perfect example, of, another example, boiling point elevation, pre freezing point depression, is in antifreeze slash coolant. So you go buy a, buy, a, buy a bottle of this stuff at the auto zone or whatever, and, and it goes and you put it with water into your, into your radiator. And it's antifreeze and coolant. How can it do both? Well, the answer is that it's antifreeze because by dissolving that antifreeze solution in water, you lower the freezing point, making it have to be colder to freeze. But you also raise the boiling point. 
and so the 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 solution of the and the coolant with the water increases the boiling point so now the water will be able to get to a higher temperature without boiling when the engine gets very hot uh, and so again for freezing point depression boiling point elevation i want you to understand these concepts i just discussed but uh, I do, you do not need to do any calculations related to those. Likewise for osmosis, it's the same thing. Your book will have some calculations on osmotic pressure. Uh, I, you don't need to do those calculations, but you do need to understand the concept of osmosis. So osmosis means that a solvent will pass from a more dilute solution to a more concentrated solution if they are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, such as a cell membrane, so your own cells or cells of biological organisms, or an artificial membrane, like the membrane that is used to do reverse osmosis and purify water. Uh, reverse osmosis means we push against that uh, passage of solvent from more dilute to more concentrated. We actually make the water more dilute, meaning we take out uh, the the um, the dissolved things that we don't want by pushing against this this force of osmosis. Uh, so what is this osmosis? First of all, uh, osmosis only occurs for very small water soluble molecules uh, and, and water itself. Uh, so large molecules cannot pass through the membrane. So oh, it's only water that's going to be passing through, and maybe some small other molecules. Uh, so small water soluble mo molecules pass through the cell membrane. Colloid and suspension particles, they're too large. So we're talking protein particles, starch particles, uh, any large molecules, biomolecules, these will not pass through the membrane. Uh, your kidney operates by, the, uh, by, by osmosis. Uh, what happens is that small water soluble molecules are allowed to pass through your kidney if it's as long as it's healthy and not malfunctioning and those small water soluble molecules along with water will pass into your bladder and then be excreted uh, now sometimes uh, things other things get through that shouldn't and that are not water soluble if, if a kidney is not working and so dialysis must be employed we'll talk a little bit about dialysis at the end but what is osmosis? So osmosis, related to the idea of osmosis, is some terminology. The first term that you should be aware of is the term isotonic. So isotonic means that the concentration on both sides of a membrane are the same. Uh, and often this is referred to as uh, the concentration of your blood as well. So your blood, for example, has lots of cells around it, uh, blood cells and, and cells on the walls of your, of, of, uh, of your veins and arteries. And uh, when someone is injected with a solution into their bloodstream, it's really important that that solution is isotonic or near isotonic, meaning having the same concentration as, as the, the, the interior of the cells. Uh, for glucose, and the concentration is 5% mass over volume glucose. So if you're giving someone a glucose IV, uh, that will be the concentration of it uh, generally. And for saline, it's 0.16 molar or 0.9% uh, by mass uh, is isotonic. And so usually when you're injecting someone with these solutions, they are those concentrations, they are isotonic. So if you are giving someone a saline IV and it's 0.16 molar sodium chloride, the interior of the, the red blood cells is also 0.16 molar. And so the flow of water into and out of the cell through the cell membrane will be equal. And so there will be no harm done. Uh, that's why it's super important that saline solutions are a particular specific temp uh, concentration. So a solution that is the same uh, uh, sl same concentration as inside as as uh, as the other side of the membrane isotonic. Hypotonic is a solution that is lower in concentration than the other side of the cell membrane or the inside of the cell. So hypo remember hypo means less or under like hypodermic needle. Tonic means concentration. So this means lower in concentration. So. Let's say instead of injecting with someone with an isotonic 
saline solution, 0.16 molar, they are instead injected with a 0.1 molar sodium chloride solution. This would be disastrous because now the outside solution is less concentrated than the inside solution. It has more water and less of the sodium chloride solute. And so the water will then try to pass from the less concentrated solution outside the cell to the more concentration more concentrated solution inside the cell because this will dilute the interior of the cell uh, and cause its concentration to come down so that it's closer to the concentration outside the cell. This can cause cells to burst. Uh, so this could be fatal to someone. Uh, this is why you don't inject someone with pure water, for example. Uh, that would be a very hypotonic solution and it would destroy their cells, in, uh, their red blood cells in their blood. And uh, so the concentration of saline solution and, and glucose solution has to be very carefully monitored before, it, you know, when it's produced and, and so that it can be uh, used safely uh, when used in a hospital. An example of, uh, of hypotonic solutions uh, in daily life is if you go to the, the grocery store, you may see them misting the vegetables with water all the time. There's a reason for this. Uh, it's because it, if you're putting water on them, you're putting a hypotonic solution on the outside of the cells of the vegetables. So that will cause, that will mean that the water will want to go into the cell to try to equalize the concentration. And this will cause the vegetables to stay crisp. Uh, your, your celery, for example, usually has quite a long shelf life. Uh, it won't, it won't, uh, as long, you know, as, if it's in your fridge, it probably will take a while before it goes bad, but it will become limp relatively quickly uh, because the refrigerator is pretty dry. And so the water will start to pass out of the cells. But if you take that same celery and you put it in, uh, you know, a container full of water, you will cause, uh, you will cause the solution, the, the, the water to rush into the cells and be, and and become rid they will become rigid and the uh the vegetable will be uh crisp again uh, it's because again you expose the vegetable cells to a hypotonic solution so the water wants to go into the interior of the cells to equalize that concentration and that causes the uh the the cells to be you know to 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 be the the actual vegetable to be crisper because the cells are again once again filled with water The opposite of hypotonic is hypertonic. So hypertonic is a is a solution that is more concentrated than the other side of the cell membrane or the interior of the cell in this case. So if you were to inject someone with a hypertonic solution of sodium chloride, the water on the interior of the cell would want to travel outward in order to dilute the exterior uh, solution here and bring it to the same concentration as the interior this would cause the cell to shrink and to shrivel which could also be dangerous for a person now another kitchen example of this is pickles you may notice that uh, although pickle cucumbers are generally small cucumbers to begin with the when you look at a cucumber it usually looks a little sh uh, shriveled and wrinkled and stuff and this is because you put it in a a solution that is hypertonic, high concentration of salt or sugar, and this causes the water to leave the cell. And so the cucumber, it looks kind of shrunken and shriveled because of that. Also, because salt, sodium chloride is, is individual ions, those ions can also to some extent pass through the membrane. And so the, the pickle itself becomes salty. In terms of osmotic pressure, so osmotic pressure is the force behind this movement of the water across the cell membrane. It is also a colligative property. It also depends on the concentration of the solute particles, not what solute they are. Uh, the more concentrated solu the solution is, the greater the pressure of the, the water trying to move across the membrane will be. And uh, so in living cells, the, you know, we can have artificial membranes uh, and, we, and living cells have, have uh, biological membranes and they, they act in the same way. They only allow small water-soluble molecules to pass through. 
uh, if you put a living cell into seawater, it will lose water uh, through osmosis and, and become dehydrated. Uh, this is why you cannot drink salt water uh, in the sea to, to quench your thirst. It's because it's actually going to dehydrate you because you're, you're putting that hypertonic solution in, which draws the water out of the cells. Uh, again, when it comes to osmosis and osmotic pressure, I'm not going to have you calculate osmotic pressure. So problems in the book where you calculate the osmotic pressure, you don't have to do those. I do expect you to understand the concept of osmosis though. This will be very important for those of you, especially going on to, uh, to learn about biological sciences and, and the healthcare professions, of course. And this has a direct application in the healthcare professions in dialysis. Uh, so dialysis is where you have a uh, uh, you have an artificial membrane that is doing the work of the biological membranes in your kidneys. Uh, and in so in this dialysis machine, only small water soluble compounds can pass through, uh, just like a kidney. Uh, and and so insoluble ionic compounds and molecules like large biomolecules, proteins, starches, these will not pass through. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, uh, oh, whoops. Uh, sometimes these do pass through and that's how you get kidney stones and things like that. Uh, so in the last chapter, I was asking you for ionic compounds and covalent compounds to determine uh, which would be soluble in water. And a related question is which would pass through a healthy kidney? Only small water soluble molecules would pass through a healthy kidney. Okay. Uh, so again, I'm basically asking you, I'm asking you two questions now. Are these water soluble? And are they also small molecules, not large bio, bio, uh, biological molecules? So remember, if you want to figure out if, a, if a, uh, something is soluble or not, first you have to decide, is it ionic or covalent? Calcium carbonate is ionic because it has a metal. Calcium. So if we're looking at the periodic table here, we can see calcium's on the left. It's a metal. It is ionic. CH4, carbon is a nonmetal, hydrogen is a nonmetal. That means this is covalent. NH3, nitrogen a nonmetal, hydrogen's a nonmetal. These are covalent. KCl, potassium is a metal, this is ionic. Uh, proteins, this is a biomolecule. This is a large biomolecule. So we can all, we already know for that one. The answer for that one is no. Protein should not pass through a healthy kidney. If the urine is very, very bubbly, over a long you know, period of time, don't get too concerned if, if there's bubbles from your urine, but if it's very, very bubbly, that indicates the presence of excess amounts of proteins, which are indicating uh, problems with the kidney. Uh, so that's one of the checks they do. They'll check for uh, you know, sugars in the, uh, in the urine uh, for diabetes, and they'll check for proteins in the, in the urine for uh, some malfunctioning of kidneys. For the ionic compounds to determine if they're soluble in water or not, we use the solubility rules. So I encourage you to go back, get to your notes, get those solubility rules, have them handy. You notice that a lot of questions I ask you about require those solubility rules. So you should have those handy along with your periodic table. Uh, carbonates are generally not soluble. Uh, so this is going to be insoluble. And so the answer is going to be no. This will not pass through a healthy kidney. Uh, the other ionic compound here is potassium chloride. Potassium chloride has a group one metal ion, K plus one. Uh, those are always soluble when they have those. So this is soluble. And the answer there would be yes. Uh, things like, you know, uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, chloride ions, those are gonna pass into the urine. Okay, for the remainder, you have to figure out if they're polar or not. So these are covalent, you have to figure out if they're polar or not. 
I'll just give you a shortcut here. Remember I told you that it would probably be useful to you, for you to remember that carbon hydrogen bonds are not polar. Uh, CH4 has all carbon hydrogen bonds. If we drew a Lewis structure, it looked like this, but we actually don't have to draw, draw the whole Lewis structure because if we just look, are there any polar bonds? Well, only the only bonds there are, are carbon and hydrogen bonds. And the electronegativity difference here is going to be uh, 2.5 for carbon and 2.2 for hydrogen. And so this bond is not polar. The difference is 0 0.3. There are no polar bonds in this molecule. So we can already know that it is not polar. Because to be polar, it has to have at least one polar bond and it has to be asymmetrical. This one is symmetrical with a tetrahedral shape and it has no polar bonds. So this is nonpolar. The answer will be no. Now, ammonia has Lewis structure like this. And a nitrogen hydrogen bond is superpolar. In fact, uh, you may just remember that if you have a nitrogen hydrogen bond, you've got hydrogen bonding forces. This is definitely a polar molecule. We can tell because its shape is trigonal pyramidal, which is asymmetrical. And its, its bonds are polar. Uh, nitrogen has a electronegativity of 3.0, and for hydrogen it's 2.2. Again, make sure you have that electronegativity table. We've been using that a lot lately. You'll need that. Uh, so that is 0 0.8 here. Polar bonds, asymmetrical. This is polar. So the answer here would be yes. And indeed, uh, you do have ammonia in the urine. Uh, in, in fact, it's not generally in the form of ammonia, though. It's generally in the form of this molecule. It looks like this. Which is called urea. Uh, that's your body's efficient way of getting rid of ammonia, which are the byproducts of protein metabolism. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get closer to the uh, end of, of the, the class when we talk about uh, bio, bio, uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry. So uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, in, this, in this chapter, we covered solutions and their concentrations and how to calculate the concentrations and how, or how much solute or solvent is in the solution. And then we talked about heterogeneous mixtures and the colligative properties, including freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmosis, which is very, very important uh, for, for um, all of you studying healthcare professions. It's extremely important to biological processes. Uh, so I hope this was interesting and enlightening to all of you, especially you future healthcare professionals and all scientists. Of course, all science is interesting to most scientists. And uh, that's it for this week. And uh, that's and I'll, I'll I'll see you next time. Have a good one.